Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Dom. His full name is Dr. Dominic Nischwitz. And super excited to talk about dentistry and naturopathy. He's a specialist in those areas. He's a world specialist in biological dentistry and ceramic implants and the current vice president of the International Society of Metal-Free Implantology. With his father, he co-founded DNA Health and Aesthetic Center for Biological Dentistry in Germany in 2015. He's also... He's also excuse, exclusively used ceramic implants since 2013, placing more than 5,000 to date. A pioneer in the field of holistic dentistry, Dr. Nishwitz regularly gives lectures around the world and has recently published his first book, It's All in Your Mouth, all capitals, <laughs> at Chelsea Green. He trains traditional dentists in biological dentistry and believes that optimal health starts in the mouth. So thank you for coming on, Dr. Dom. And I'd also like to mention he's also a very friendly and nice guy and very personable, good guy. So thanks for coming on. Thanks, Joe, for having me. My pleasure. Awesome. So let's talk about the mouth. Tell me, what are, so, what are some things that people don't know is related to not having good oral care? Like what are certain diseases or certain conditions? If someone's got low energy or tell us, blow, blow our minds a bit. <laughs> what most people actually don't know is that the mouth is the entrance to your body and basically all chronic disease have a link to the oral health. So bad oral health equals poor overall health. It's linked to heart disease, cardiovascular disease, metabolic issues, insulin resistance, Alzheimer's, neurological disease, Parkinson's, depression, mental health issues, you name it. Okay. And how does somebody know if they have a problem in their mouth? If, if there's a problem brewing in their mouth, how do they know? So first of all, have you ever had dental work done in your mouth? Then you know you had a problem. And there are three questions I would always ask from a biological point of view, which is number one, do you have or have, a, have had any metals in your mouth? Number two, have you ever had a root canal treatment? And number three, did they remove your wisdom teeth? Those are the questions that directly refer to the oral interference or the three health killers that are lurking in your mouth and you're probably not even aware of. So let's, let's go through me as an example. Did I have any fillings, any metal fillings? The answer is no. Okay. So good. good there. Number two, well, number three was wisdom teeth. I did have those taken out. Okay. Bad move. Bad move. I tell you later, but Let, let's get back to it. Number two was root canals. I'm not, I, you know what? I don't even know if I've ever had a root canal. I'm not sure. I think, I'm pretty sure I had one when I was younger. It definitely was not after like the age of 10 or, or 12 or something. Like I would have remembered that, but I don't actually, I don't know if I've ever had a root canal. Is that weird? No, actually a lot of people don't know that a root canal. Some, obviously, I think you didn't have one. Because it's a massive painful treatment and usually you need it because of massive pain. So you would probably remember the pain because the root mm -hmm. canal treatment is unfortunately necessary for a lot of people as an acute pain treatment because otherwise you just die from, from the pain. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. But the wisdom so I probably did not have it. The wisdom teeth got me. Now they I got gotta you. be careful. They got me. They, what wanted, they, they told me I needed to take my wisdom teeth out or else my teeth would crowd up too much. And this is, this is totally normal. I would say this is the usual thing in the Western world. And, but it is 100% unnatural. So why would nature design us to have no space for our wisdom teeth? Makes no sense. Let's talk about this for a second, because I think yeah. this is a really interesting point. Why do people's teeth suck in general? Like it, people have really crowded teeth. Like if you go to, especially in developed worlds where they're, they're not putting on much braces, or countries that don't fund braces, 
or or where people you know don't really care. You see people with like a lot of crooked teeth, especially on the bottom. It's just all crowded together. How the hell does that come about? So it depends. So I I don't believe that all straight everything one hundred percent aligned is one hundred percent natural. So even I have a little bit crowded teeth. But if you really go to places where you fully live the ancestral way of life with no contact to processed foods whatsoever, like Western Price showed 100 years ago, you actually have a perfect set of 32 teeth, maybe a little bit misaligned, but not crowded. And you have a perfect posture. You breathe through your nose. Everything is kind of like natural because nature has it right. It's the beauty of it. But as soon as we get in contact with processed foods, you know, gluten-containing grains, sugars, refined vegetable oils, and all the processed stuff, we get weak and soft and we get problems in growing up. So basically our body or the architecture architecture, and doesn't happen the way it's supposed to be. It's basically an epigenetic issue. It starts in the womb already. So how, if, what are these hunter-gatherer like tribes like in terms of their oral health? Do they, do they have crowding? Is there, you know, what do their teeth look like? Do they brush their teeth? Usually no. Usually you in a in a if you eat like really like if you look at Hadza and let's say Maasai, really people that are the tribes that are still hundred percent hunters and gatherers, they don't brush their, their teeth really. Maybe they use a stick or something. But they eat hard foods, hard foods and not so much processed foods. They those foods brush your teeth in itself. They clean your mm. teeth. Also by chewing hard stuff, you get hard teeth, teeth hard as stone and and wide jaws, and you support your body with the right nutrients in your upbringing. And this is what I said, it starts in the womb. It doesn't make any sense to start now when you're 32 years old. Obviously, it still makes sense, but... But what does it mean, starts in the womb? Like, the the mother has to eat this food? Basically, a mom should be prepared for pregnancy already, like in this unnatural world, but eat good food. Then you build a good, healthy baby. The set of tea... The first set of teeth is already developed in like the twenty in the twentieth week of a of a unborn child, like really. Oh early. wow! And the wow. second so- pair, like these teeth, the, they are already also growing. So when you, they are there when you go, like the the dental buds are already also developed very very ah. early. So you see, I didn't know that. So you're saying that dental health really starts with your mother. <laughs> Yes, basically all your health starts with your mother. <laughs> and right. all, if your well, mom is super toxic you and she doesn't take care of it, then all the toxins go directly through the placenta, placenta into the unborn baby. That's also quite That's deep. true, but we don't, you know, we, we tend to think of like, you know, generally when people, I, I think when you look at people, you look at kids, if a kid is relatively healthy, if they're living very, relatively healthy, they're usually healthy, right? If they're not eating just junk food all day or whatever, if they're eating a good diet, then the kid is going to be healthy, even if the mom wasn't perfect, right? The people are seem to be pretty robust in that sense, and the health problems really come later. The thing is with the teeth, though, you don't necessarily see that. You don't see that if somebody is eating relatively healthy, they then have really good teeth. Like they generally need dentists. And so something seems to be wrong in in how things are occurring. Whereas you're saying that these ancestral tribes don't have weird teeth. Like some people just have weird teeth. Like it's grown in weird places. It's like rotting and a whole bunch. Of, there's like so many problems. If so... I- I see your tooth or your mouth as a mirror to your overall health. So if you have rotten teeth or weak teeth or mushy teeth, this is a sign of overall issues. It's a deficiency because a tooth in itself is hard as granite. You can measure this if it's natural. You can get harder. But in the Western world, it's getting softer and softer and softer. Therefore, we are getting, mm-hmm. we are trained as dentists to recommend fluoride toothpaste because that mm-hmm. makes the tooth harder. But in itself, your diet, your minerals, your lack of minerals, your lack of proteins, will your teeth make soft in the first place? So hunters and gatherer tribes, at least the ones that Western Price visited 100 years ago, they have perfect teeth. But this is why it's so, it was, this book is so great because you can see their, their children getting, getting in contact with processed foods, having no 
adoption to these foods. And they look like monsters, crowded teeth, mouse breathing, full of gingivitis, periodontitis, lots of calculus, cavity, as crowding and spacing issues. Basically, they look like our teenagers in the Western world. So in Germany, in the US, like all here in Europe, it's Western world for me. And most of us need braces. And most of us have no space for wisdom teeth. Most of us are just grown too narrow. And this starts in the womb. Then there's breastfeeding. Breastfeeding builds your jawbone. Mouth breathing, nose breathing. You see, this is like an ongoing process. It's not just the womb. It's just where it starts. Even right. And, and I guess, I mean, the, the only problem with the argument about, well, nature has wisdom teeth, right? So then there, there's, there, you definitely, you, you need them because nature has them. And by the way, I believe in that argument. The question is, because of how we are living now, right, and, and the fact is that we do have crowded teeth for, you know, some of the reasons you mentioned. I don't know if we know all the reasons, but I, I kind of think, like, you can make the same argument of, like, in, in some way, I'm not comparing it, but this is me playing devil's advocate. Don't get glasses because nature would give you good vision. If it didn't give you good vision, you would die out pretty quickly. Like, if you had... Imagine like everybody today, right? Mo I got LASIK, so I don't have glasses anymore. But if I had my vision 200 years ago or in any time in the past, then I would be so selected against because you can't really see very well. That's like a, a very big evolutionary pressure against that. So it's very clear to me that nature definitely designed us so that we we can see, we should be able to see very well, but our lifestyles mainly like, being indoors, not getting enough sunlight is making us all need glasses, right? And so I kind of think about, is that the same situation as wisdom teeth, right? Is it like, yes, obviously nature has designed wisdom teeth for a reason, but is there any situation where you'd be like, it's important to get rid of it? Yeah, of course, of course. It's not possible to keep them at points. The, the, the issue is more like, why are we degenerating? Vision is degenerating. We are losing teeth. We have no space anymore for our teeth. Why are, getting, why are we getting weaker and softer and softer and softer? Obviously, you said it. Screen time. Sunlight is the same for teeth. You need natural sunlight to produce vitamin D3 to get your minerals into your teeth. You know, same for the vision, for the eyesight. But also glasses is just basically, it's a cast, you know? There's the same, there was, a, when the glasses were developed, there was another school of thought when it comes to eyesight where, from Russia, where they train your eyes in terms of muscle and they can all see, but no doctor will train you how to train your eyes and muscle because it's effort, but it's super easy to give you glasses. And obviously it's super easy to wisdom to but yes, there are definitely situations, unfortunately, because of our lifestyle that most of us need to take the wisdom teeth out, myself included. I had no space. Mm. I had braces twice. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and you're saying you would have taken them off now if you had to, if you know everything you know now, would you have still taken them off? The problem for me was I had impacted wisdom teeth. Impacted wisdom teeth, understand? They would never grow out. So my, my development of my whole jaw was so poor that it didn't widen enough and it lengthened enough. It stopped at one time, a point, but because I probably had a nutrient deficiency in the upbringing or sunlight deficiency, mm. whatever. And your dad was a dentist. <laughs> Regular dentist. He is still a dentist. Right. He's a biology that now trained by myself, but he, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but the, the story we have is, at least in Germany, and I think in, in the US is the same, is it's kind of normal that you have a school leave for certain wisdom tooth surgery. It's kind of like in the plan. It's just normal. You will look right. like this for a minute. They have to take out your teeth. Then you get the set of braces because everybody gets it. But for me, it's like I see a patient sometimes and like, wow, you have so beautiful teeth. Did you get braces and stuff? Or do you have your wisdom teeth? It's like, no, no, just grew like this. And it's like, damn, I'm jealous. The new parents might have done a good job. And they always tell me I have no... We, we really, my parents were really natural. They cooked their foods. We had like, not, we, we weren't allowed to go to McDonald's back then. We didn't have the 90s, 10s. Mm. They, they were just more naturally focused and breastfeeding and no antibiotics like myself. Because my dad is a dentist. My mom is a nurse, is a, not a nurse. What's my mom? I don't know. Kid, child, children, oh, children. She works with children in the hospital back then. So I never know what it is in English. Okay. But both medically trained. Therefore, 
I would get antibiotics for everything as a kid because obviously they were afraid. And this is a, this is a big issue in the upbringing. So I, my upbringing wasn't the best and I don't blame my parents. My parents just obviously did it for the best. Same year, I have a lot of, I, I myself, I have kids and you know how it is. If you go to a doctor, general doctor, it's really hard to say no to these things because they have their arguments. You have to do this and you have to do that. So do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. Click the subscribe button now and enjoy the rest of the episode. You know, I'm going to want kids at some point. I want to make sure my kids have good teeth. What, or, or a woman wants to have kids. What does she need to do in the womb? Like you said you had these impacted wisdom teeth. How do we make sure kids' teeth are, you know, they're good, like, from from the womb, let's let's go from the womb and then let's go after that. Like, take me through how do we raise a human species that has incredible teeth naturally? What do we need to do? Yes, go as natural as possible. So if you can as a mom, and I know not everybody can, breastfeed your baby for at least 18 months, which is one and a half years, maybe even longer. Why? What does that do, for example? Yeah. Exactly. Breastfeeding requires strength to pull on that nipple, pull on that breast or suck on that breast. You need 12 times more muscle strength than from a baby bottle. And what it does, mm -hmm. it pulls your jawbone and your grows forward. It pulls so you get a, a strong jawline. And why? Because at the same time, it trains nose breathing. If you have something in your mouth, you have to breathe through your nose at the same time. Otherwise, you cannot, you die. Mm -hmm. So you widen your palate and you widen and elongate your jawline. So it grows, it grows your skeletal structure of your jaw and your, basically your whole mid face. Most okay. sparks won't get breastfed that long. So I was, I was breastfed probably for like nine months, six months, which is actually quite good. But then afterwards is next phase. Now what comes after breastfeeding? And obviously I don't say you should 100% breastfeed. At one point you give, food for the kids too, they are weaning and whatever. But then obviously you, you have to know how to think in nutrients and what do you need to build that body because your kids are actually growing and they shouldn't do the kids menu. So they should eat proper whole foods, macronutrient design, protein first, and then the right sources of carbohydrates and fats, basically how we did it or how our ancestors did it. Stay away from processed foods. What, what does Somebody need to, what, what nutrients do we need to focus on? So somebody stays away from processed food. So number one, right? You mentioned it starts in the womb. We, yeah. we started talking about breastfeeding, right? So that's, that's number one. That's really important for dental health. Great information. I wonder if there's any device like that can mimic the breast <laughs> to get that. Like a, a, that would be a, a good invention, like a, a bottle that mimics the breast. You know, they, what, there are devices that kind of mimic the breast, but the breast comes also with other very, yeah, let's say, good information that you need, like oxytocin and bonding, right. all these things. So sure. you don't want to mess. Sure. The, you don't want to miss. Yeah, it. yeah. No, I, I agree. It's very hard to replicate breastfeeding in a formula, right? There's oh, it's been a, formulas are so tough. There, most of the formulas, if you look at you, you know, but if you look at the ingredients, you could never feed this to your kid. It's like the worst design of everything. It's like a packed food of the most pro-inflammatory foods plus artificial supplements and fortified stuff. Like it's really seed oils. And you cannot, if you look at the standard thing, it's the nastiest thing. You cannot feed this to your baby. But unfortunately, so we do. What is, okay, so let's start in the womb. What does a mother need to consume in order to have healthy teeth? I, and I could just throw some things out there. Calcium. Vitamin K2, magnesium, D3, D3. In, in pregnancy, you can Google this or Google Scholar. It, it, D3 declines in pregnancy. You need more vitamin D3 during mm -hmm. pregnancy. Okay. 
What about fish oil? Does that help? Yes, omega-3 fatty acids, especially in the third trimester, you need to focus on a variety of healthy fats to produce cream. You want to feed cream to your baby. Ah, uh, okay. You I get got really it. really anabolic. It's like you but get that's, butter, that's for avocado. breastfeeding. I'm talking about in the womb. Is Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the womb, same. Same, same, same. same. Okay. Because third trimester or mid, mid to third trimester, the whole, the whole nervous system develops. So I would focus on DHA, EPA containing omega-3 fatty acids, especially if they're from triglyceride based. I wouldn't do the concentrates actually. I would eat fish. I would really eat meat, fish. I would eat butter, eggs, avocado, like the, the good stuff. Also carbohydrates, you will need them to produce your hormones. You need a lot of bit of insulin production going. What about is something vitamin A is very important for tooth development, right? I would, I wouldn't. If you eat an animal-based diet, you wouldn't need to supplement vitamin A. I think it's enough in food. But right. if you're vegetarian or vegan, you definitely need to look it up. Okay. So did I miss any important nutrients that, besides the one that we that were mentioned? Number one nutrient that most people miss is the macronutrient protein, especially amino acids, especially mm. during pregnancy. Because a pregnant woman goes through around about five marathons. It's then high of an energy expenditure and demand in terms of recovery. It's insane. So really two grams per kilogram lean body mass and protein is minimum requirement in pregnancy. It's generally the minimum requirement, in my, in my opinion. And for do, you, do you think that for dentistry related things, women are not getting enough protein? Yes. Not just women. Also, like I, I see a lot of patients and most people... You know that the, the recommended daily allowance is like 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. And I recommend 1.6 to better 2, 2 grams, at least during surgery in all these phases. And I see a pregnancy kind of like a surgery phase. It's an intense, mm. an intense endeavor. It's like high athlete work. So athletes should consume a little bit more protein. Okay. So, okay. So that was the one that we missed. Protein is extremely important for dental development. Whether it's the kid, the mother, the whole shebang. Throughout the development phase, the, the kid needs to consume enough protein. Protein, healthy fats, we had that. And then yeah. what is D3, K2, calcium, magnesium, zinc, boron. Maybe like the, the few trace minerals, a nice electrolyte, obviously. Boron as trace element is very good for a lot of things. Look up the study, nothing boring about boron. Best review. <laughs> like you find everything in. It's a review on PubMed. It's really good. And I would also just like to say that there's certain nutrients. For example, me, I was always deficient in zinc from an early age, even though I, I always consumed meat. And when I look at my genetic predisposition, it, it shows that I'm low on, I have an increased need for zinc. I have lower zinc levels. Have you ever tested if you have a so-called cryptopyrolurea, HPO it's also called, hem pyrolectamurea? I've Some heard of it. I've not done it. Yeah, the thing is, if you have this condition, so it's basically just a symptom of an underlying issue. For example, like your wisdom teeth that we remove. And your body just, in this case, it's a mixture of chronic infection and inflammation toxins. Your body changes biochemistry and you will lose zinc in a 24-hour urine panel like crazy, plus vitamin B6 and, and manganese and molybdenum. So look that up and it's a common symptom. This is why this is all structured in my pre and post treatments for dental issues because a lot of people miss zinc. So just, just, just so, so people could see a little bit, you could see that vitamin K and zinc, two of the nutrients that we mentioned here, mm. I was always deficient on these. And, and you have it in genetics also. Nice. It's in genetics, yeah. I, I just pulled it up now in, in a diet. And, there's a diet and nutrition report, but these are the individual markers here. And it shows that I have an increased need. And I know from just health, optimiza health optimization for 20 years and also from my labs that I was deficient on zinc and vitamin K2. When I don't take vitamin K, even if I'm eating a lot of vegetables, by the way, it's funny because I could be eating a ton of meat and vegetables. My whole diet was meat and vegetables, which has a lot of vegetables have a lot of K, right? Like I used to get nosebleeds too if I didn't eat a lot of vegetables. So the vegetables have the vitamin K and so if you have a, a kid with nosebleeds, it's most likely the kid needs more vegetables. In my case, I had an increase, like I was eating more vegetables than any kid I've ever known, <laughs> right? So 
you, I think the genetic predisposition that. is really important for these kinds of things. But you didn't know your predisposition as a kid. So you just by chance ate more vegetables? You liked it as a kid? No, oh. I, I got lucky in a certain sense that my mother was very into health and she oh. knew that she just kind of, she, there was this thing called ground up salad. You basically put a shit ton of vegetables in a blender, you blend it, and then you drink it, right? Like and, and, and huh? It's like a smoothie. Yeah, you just put in like uh, cucumbers, romaine lettuce, some tomatoes, and you know some other vegetables, and and you just blend it in a smoothie. Mainly cucumbers and romaine lettuce, and you just drink this down. So that obviously is going to have a ton of vitamin K, and that's what I think really fixed it. And then after that, I you know just eating a, a healthy diet of of a lot of vegetables, I never got them again. Things like that is what spurred me to eat healthy, even from a young age. I actually can see that kids would do a blended, blended. Actually, I would also do a blended salad. I like to eat vegetables now, but as a kid, I would never touch it at all. Oh, wow. No, I was like very picky on foods, but obviously also unfortunately ate a lot of fast foods and bad foods in my childhood already and started young with the better. So I, I, did, I crashed my health first. That's why I went on this health optimization journey. I had to fix me first. What age did you crash your health? So I was, I was always very athletic, but always had something chronic. The chronic inflamed tonsils. I took tons of antibiotics. They took out my appendix when I was 15. They took out mm. my wisdom teeth. All these things. I had massive acne as a teenager. And they also gave me antibiotics against this. And then they gave me Accutane against it. Then I had Accutane's bad stuff. Bad man. And this is something I still, my liver still needs to deal with. I had it twice. Braces, oh, wow. everything. And I just thought it's normal. I never thought about it. It's just like, shit, I can't skateboard. I need another antibiotic. I have to give up all sports. And my brother had the same, acne massively. So, you know, it's so interesting that you talk about that. Like, we're, you know, you're a kid. You're just like, oh, yeah, of course, you got to take your tonsils out. You got to take your wisdom teeth out. <laughs> you need my glasses. You know, yeah, you're. Glasses, and then you have hay fever. And then you get. Get your appendix cut out. That's You're sick all the time. Nosebleeds. It's just like a death by a thousand cuts. Yes, and nobody even talk, thinks about it. I I didn't either. I just thought, okay, I'm unlucky right now. And but up until this day, up until twenty, and I had all these things. I just thought that's how life is. It just it comes from the outside. But then when I was twenty one, I crashed big time. And I get depressed, and I was like down. Like so down, I had to find a solution. And I am naturally a very, I'm naturally like this. I'm a very happy guy. But from that point, it was really flipped from one day to the other. Wow. I was sad and crying. And I thought, I, the feeling I had, I can still remember. It was like, man, I just want to be normal again. Why is this not going away? It felt like I'm in a dream. But I remembered my one foot being in the real life. And I knew I want to be normal again. And I went to everybody and I and my parents, and I didn't tell anybody because early 2000, it was like a dogma. If you're depressed in Germany, you're kind of doomed for life. So I kept it for myself. Only my girlfriend back then knew it. And my parents, and they were very scared. I wasn't really scared. I was just like, I need to fix this. I, but there was no health optimization. There was no YouTube. There was no internet. There was no nothing. So I just went on a journey with the training, nutrition, supplements, biochemistry, all the studies. Wow. That's why I started so young. And it took me about the whole university time. Obviously, I realized I can't drink six days a week anymore. So I was, was my own fault. I was just partying too hard. And then I flipped at one point. Actually, it was a blessing in disguise. Back then, it didn't feel good. But I learned everything from it. And when I finally realized what was the problem, it took me only a week to fix. My neurotransmitters were just totally out of whack. And that's why I still use this assessment called Braver, Braverman's assessment for all my patients that come in to assess their neurotransmitters. This is the fastest way to see what's get built in the gut, but I am not interested in what's swimming around in your, in your gut. I want to know what is in your brain. And I'm a natural dopamine dominant person. And I was just having a dopamine deficiency. I didn't know it. Everybody was talking about serotonin and whatever. I didn't never take, never took any medication because I was into supplements and bodybuilding and training. And I wanted to, I wanted to just find a solution. And when I had it, you obviously get addicted to getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And like the three to four years when I had it, this is really bad. And if you're depressed like myself, it, you need to understand that this is a signpost that something in your whole body is really out of balance. 
diet, nutrition, lifestyle, all the things. And you can actually take responsibility and optimize. And now, luckily, we have you. You can test your genetics. We have a ton of biohackers, health optimization specialists that teaching this. But imagine 20 years ago, it wasn't existing. So there was nobody. And then you have your own solutions. You mentioned checking your neurotransmitters. I actually found it was very helpful for me to check my BDNF in my oh, genetics, yeah. my dopamine. So the DRD2 receptor is very good. And I find that I have been deficient on dopamine with this particular receptor. And I'm, I definitely am lower in BDNF. So these kinds of things are super import, important for mood. Another one that's really important is you look at the mood report. So it so, shows that I have a tendency for lower mood. And if you look at the report in the recommendations, uh, which is the most important, you could see which variants, especially in the recommendations, is is problematic. And for me, yeah, uh, there's so this is the dopamine D two receptor you see. So there's recommendations for that. But oh, there's so a TPHT TPH two gene, which for me was like critical, right? This is one of the main mechanisms by which my mood was always chronically unstable, and. Really, everything that improves this enzyme really improves my mood a lot. And what we do is we look at just all your SNPs. In this case, we look at 85,000 variants to come up with a polygenic score. But you want, like with the recommendations, for me, 5-HTP is prioritized because I have this variant over here. And so now I take 5 methylfolate, niacin, and 5-HTP as well. That combination basically just completely got rid of all my mood issues. And that's why I think like the genetics now is, is a game changer. I think the, the Braverman tool is, is cool in certain ways to see, you know, what your symptoms are. But now we have, we could see how your biochemistry is actually ticking. Yes, yeah, obviously the Braverman is only a quick assessment. And then having genes like in your self decoders even is obviously you way more advanced. Like you could have, you cannot even compare, but just initially to tell you of what, at least for me is like, okay, you really have a deficiency in something and you can manage it was good to know. And then going to log into yourself, the code, and then getting the information straight away. Okay. Now this is your gene. Just take five HTP and take rhodiola and take zinc in the morning. And you also need P5P because you don't work with B6. You need an activated methylated right. folate and B6. Perfect. Same for me. So that's fast track. So that's what I mean. 20 years ago, it wasn't existing. There wasn't even no right. brave It came later. No supplements at all weren't popular. Not at all. Only bodybuilding supplements like creatine and whey protein and the basics. They, they were popular, but not these things. The only thing a doctor would prescribe you was the same as now, like a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which makes right. sense for a dopamine deficiency. You need and something. It, and yeah. you don't do medications that deplete B6 and magnesium and zinc. It, this is what I mean. And I also had a functional medicine doctor back then giving me my, that was amazing. He gave me my spreadsheet. My, it finally took me a few years and I had a massive blood work with everything. And he then presented me like one bottle of what I should take. And I was like, with my knowledge back then, I was like, that won't work. So I do it myself. So I went to a bulk page and bought all the raw materials that I knew I need to dopamine synthesize and for my mm. other thing, I was just buying tyrosine and smashing two grams in the morning and tryptophan two grams in the evening and it took me a week to fix it. This is super simple. Wow. You Do you still I, take that? I don't think, I still always take a bit of tyrosine in my formula. I have one amino acid formula, which is the same for these things for my problems, neurotransmitters, mm. detoxification the immune system. There's a bit of tyrosine in it, not a lot. Only a little bit, but it works in synergy. It's a, it's a complex formulation like yours too. This is one of, you know, I have a co company too for these things. And same as you, it, I developed these things for the need out of my creations to get optimal and help the many out there, ho hopefully with it. And, and tyrosine is in it. I take five HTP. What is the formula called? It's called Amino Supreme. Amino Supreme. And what's the brand? Yeah, Substitution. SUP set nutrition. Okay, cool. Oh. Well, let's go back to some of the dental health that we were talking about. I, I, I like. I mean, we got into this because obviously, 
everything kind of interacts with each other, right? You need to make sure you're getting enough vitamin K, vitamin zinc, and all these kinds of minerals. Super let's, important. Yeah. So let, let's go back into, now, how does somebody know whether their problems are related to their mouth or not, right? So we know that there's a lot of research, and you brought it up, like dental health is associated with pretty much like every chronic disease, because if you've got inflammation in your mouth, then you're going to have inflammation in your body. And that's inflammation is going to lead to disease. Is that the main mechanism? Did I get that right? Chronic inflammation, chronic cytokines for sure, but also chronic infections. Okay. And also toxicity is a big one because dental repair is mostly done with materials that are not supposed to be in your body. For example, mercury fillings. Mercury is the most toxic non-radioactive element known to men should be a no-brainer to not put it in your body. Still in there. So, and also the third piece when it comes to metals is always in nowadays for metal challenges besides immune system and toxicology that every metal in your body is going to be an antenna because we have 3G, 4G, 5G, mm. and all these radars. So you, in your nervous system, what do you have to understand is your brain and your teeth and your mouth is an extension of your brain, like your eyes. Your teeth are tiny organs. There's one cranial nerve called trigeminal nerve. And we have 12, you know, we have 12 cranial nerves in the brainstem, and they go here, and the trigeminal nerve takes 50% of all the space of all the cranial nerves. So it's really, really important one. And the teeth are actually the end of it. So whatever you do on that nerve or in that mouth will transfer through retrograde axonal transfer, toxicity, immunological, chronic inflammation is a big one. It's a silent killer, you know. You don't want to have a chronic inflammation. Imagine you have a chronic inflammation on your hand. You see it all the time. Obviously, you go to a doctor and you do something. But actually, your hand or your arm is not that important for your body. But if you have it ongoing in your nervous system, this is a part of your brain. You have a toxic brain. It's called toxic vagal syndrome. It's directly connected with your parasympathetic nervous system, with your, the trigeminus and the nerves, the vagal nerve run together. And every two okay. direct connection to a specific organ from the nerve, nervous system. This is more Chinese medicine, meridian system, but you can test it with electroacupuncture. So it's really, really insane. It's kind of like these T's are external hard drives for your brain. So it's really, it's really crazy. Tell me about one thing I was always curious about with dental health is how did the Western, the, the Maasai tribes, these ancestral tribes, how do they floss? Because I find that when I'm eating a flawless diet of meat and liver and vegetables, which is most, most of my diet, I still need a floss or I notice there's kind of like a bad bacteria that can grow within between my teeth. So what do you think about the fact that they is flossing a good invention or what did we do before? I think what we did before is just use a, use a pick, toothpick, a, a stick or something. So to get it out. And, but also, but, you have, you how does it work? What, what kind of dental work, work then, right? I, I, had, had, I had, I had, I mean, I've had a filling, I think in the past. Yeah. But why is that? Why is that re related to flossing? Okay. Because as soon as you change the anatomy of your teeth right next to each other and the gum inside, it can happen that food gets stuck easier in between. Because natural teeth, like I have, I have no feeling, nothing. They're tight and the gum grows up. So I barely never have anything stuck in my, foot, in my, in my teeth. That's why I personally always recommend not flossing. Why? Wait, you second. recommend not flossing? <laughs> wait, wait. If... Everything is perfect. Okay. In the natural world, when everything would be perfect, you don't need unnaturally to floss. But as soon as your diet is not in check, you live in an unnatural world and you had dental, previous dental work done and periodontitis and gingivitis, you probably need to floss. That's sad. But ideally, obviously, there is no tooth floss growing on the tree. This is also an invention that you don't need. And I have one point for the tooth flossing. Why I think for somebody with healthy teeth is unnecessary and maybe even bad. It's because sometimes you're not as handy and you rip through. So you cut and you bleed afterwards. And you don't bleed because you're so gentle, but because you're always cutting through. And this is the same thing as you would cut your skin always open. What do you open here? It's called leaky gum. It's the same as leaky gut. You basically open your whole system because gingiva is outside body. It's tissue to protect. If you open up the barrier by cutting it all day long, bacteria go in there. And this is how they find 
porphyronas gingivalis in your synovial fluid of your hip joint. So why would you do that? Interesting. Okay, so that's really cool. So you're saying, I've never thought about that. That's that's pretty mind-blowing information where you're saying when we floss and we bleed, that causes the bacteria to then go in the bloodstream and cause problems. Wait, if you had, like, like myself, I have perfect natural gums. I never bleed, nothing. Only time I bleed is if I use a floss and rip it through because it's stuck in between and then it snatches. If, I be, if I'm very, very gentle, I'm good with my hands. I can floss without ripping it open, but I know Do you most- you floss people... every day? No, I, floss, I don't even floss at all. You never floss? I'm... No. Wow. <laughs> No, no Dr. way. Doctor Dome, the dentist, does not floss. Let's let's. Uh, that's incredible. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Wait. But it's all natural and opti- I'm super optimized. My diet is on point, and I have no things. The thing is, if you have a general, if you now listening for the first time to health optimization, and you think this guy is crazy, and I bleed all the time, if you have a lot of inflammation in your gum right now from your diet and from all the soft food sticking there into your dental work. Please floss a little bit because actually then flossing helps you against the bleeding. You understand? If you okay. have massively inflamed okay. chronic gingivitis, so gum disease and periodontitis, you probably need to floss right now until you're at that level where you can go back to nature. Ideally, you do not floss in nature. So if I have something stuck in between, I might use a floss or I just, I personally like these, these sticks, like the usual into the dental what is that, indel dental picks, or what do you call it, the, the toothpicks? Toothpicks, yeah, yeah the, the wooden one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, why not? The toothpick. If I have a okay. one there, yeah, do the toothpick. Interesting. Take, take it, it reminds me of, of, of sun. Like, I think what you're saying is, if you floss and you're bleeding, you're doing it the wrong way, number one, right? And I would say probably you might need more vitamin K. <laughs> but I would say, so first of all, yeah. you need, first of all, you need, yes, maybe vitamin K. First of all, if you if you have perfect teeth and you and everything is un, not inflamed and then you floss and it bleeds, bad idea. If you have a lot of inflammation and you and your gums bleed, you need to floss probably because you have a lot of bacteria and the wrong things there. So that's two things. But you need nutrients. For, yeah, I would say number one would be omega three fatty acids and vitamin C because you need collagenases to get activated by vitamin C and omega three fatty acids to be anti inflammatory. If you Google periodontal disease and and Omega-3 is, funny enough, you find 300 plus studies in a second. This is really good. A lot of studies from Egypt. So Omega-3 is really, really good. You know, you know it. It's anti-inflammatory, the right. EPA content of it. Okay. And so, I mean, I, I'm still going to be flossing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't bleed when I floss, though, just to be clear. So that's important, right? That's really important that you be handy with it, but you can also use tiny interdental brushes. You don't want to have food stuck in your teeth, for sure. Right. You don't want to, okay. but you are optimizing like your diet. You would, you don't have the fur on your teeth, right? You're not drinking Coke all day long or, ha- no. or have a lot of starchy vegetables that always stick to your teeth. No. Because this is the, this is the groundwork for bacteria living on your teeth and building plaque and calculus. So right. and please floss, do that. No worries. I'm also the guy saying you don't, you should never use any chemical mouthwashes that was my next question (laughs) tell me about mouthwashes what what should it why is chemical mouthwash not good and what should people use so see your mouth as the engines to the tube that goes from here to the back door yeah it's like the engines to your whole body and what do you have in the mouth it's like a protection mechanism it's the biggest immune system is the most diversified microbiome do you want to disinfect your microbiome on a daily basis with something full of alcohol and chemical ingredients? I don't think so. Why would you not rather soothe it and improve it through, let's say, coconut oil pulling? So it's just unnecessary and it's actually bad. So for example, chlorhexidine, chlorhexidine, like stuff that they put into standard rinses, is shown to activate metallomatrix proteinases, which actually open up gums. Mm. Come on. Interesting. So you would go with, just kind of gargling oil, whether it's olive oil or coconut oil. Is that correct? The three superhuman oral healthcare strategies I say is you use a toxin free toothpaste, you do coconut oil pulling instead of the chemical mouthwashes, and a copper tongue scraper. 
that's basically enough. Why is a copper tongue scraper good? Copper is in itself antibacterial and it's coming from Ayurveda. And yeah, basically because of the antibacterial function. And what happens? So did, had, did they use copper tongue scrapers in the Maasai tribes? <laughs> like, well, I don't think well, that they use tongue Why do we need it now and they don't need it? Or I don't think you need it. It's just an amazing strategy for... Like we also, obviously, I'm quite sure when we were hunters and gatherers, our breath would probably not smell like perfume. <laughs> Very, but everybody had bad breath probably. So nobody cares. But you now, think so? In, in the, the hunter gatherers, everybody had bad breath? Not bad breath, but considering what we are used to nowadays, how we should smell, we would probably say it's a bit rough. You understand what I mean? Interesting. Not, not, okay. Not, I would not say it's a bad smell. It's not like a smell from somebody who has methods in the mouth and right. toxic, a lot of inflammation, because this is really a really, really bad, rotten, nasty, burning smell in my nose. I would just say, I think if you eat all the meats and you know your microbiome in your mouth and in your body changes within 12 to 24 hours, depending on substrate. So they just have a different mouth odor to it. I think for Westerners, it some maybe might smell a bit rough. And that, Which, I mean, my that, breath doesn't smell even in the morning now. It used to smell no, in the morning only. My, my, need, my neither. And this is where I'm coming to. I think if you're perfectly eating healthy, you don't have that all that build up. And what a tongue scraper does is basically you go to the to the base of your tongue, where overnight debris, toxins, bacteria res reside. So it's more important again for people that still eat the standard Western diet mm, because they have worse tongue mouth breathe uh, worse um, so how does somebody know whether to have a tongue scraper if their breath smells if breath smells yet yeah, I, I would just generally implement it for these strategies if the breath smells for sure and if you open up your your mouth and you look at your tongue and there's a, a coating on it kind of like a color to it on like usually your tongue should be like your gingiva like mm -hmm. has really no color it's 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 kind of like pinkish it's not red it's more like pink it looks good <laughs> or when you can see for you you see that dent in the side it's yeah yeah bladder. yeah it's your gallbladder man a bit of my gallbladder yeah, yeah i thought my teeth were just pressing against my tongue uh -huh. it's tension show me up or uh, do this no that looks good okay because for example do you see these veins down there you see the veins uh -huh. look these veins look at these veins Mm. I don't have those veins. Everybody has these veins. You have to just press on it. If these veins get big and tense, this is also a sign of tension, liver tension, liver gallbladder tension. And then also your tongue swells. Oh, I had patients, you cannot imagine. I took out root canals or, or metals in, immediately. Like you cannot imagine it if you didn't see it. Wow. You were not able to work really because the tongue was so huge. Whoa. I take out it stuff. And I tell my nurse, is this even possible? This tongue just shrank in that minute because the lymph flow was just blocked. You open wow. it up. Ooh. And this is a whole system. Same like hemorrhoids. You know hemorrhoids in the back door? This is also liver gallbladder tension. It's all tension. And funny enough, what's in the tongue? Now, how did we get to the tongue with the tongue scraper? Okay. Yeah, the tongue, I just added, during this conversation, I just added a tongue scraper to my car, a copper tongue scraper. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I'm, I'm on my way and, and also at oh, wait, there's an original one and there's a copper one. Oh, i got to add the copper one yeah and, and buy a toothpaste that is fluoride free at least and without the, titanium dioxide yeah i don't my, all my toothpaste don't have fluoride so let, let's get i mean i think bad breath is is a massive ep epidemic right do you i mean you're a dentist you probably world. huh in the western world because also everybody's nope is mouth breathing that also adds into the equation. They got they got a screwed up gut. They're mouth breathing. They're eating a bunch of carbs they and have, sugar. They have crowded teeth. They have cavities. You say you you see it's 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 kind of like we designed monsters. Our teenagers look like the monsters Weston Price showed hundred years ago, and it's our it, fault. 
it's it's like I go around. I'm like I'm living in this world where everybody's like Shrek with their bad breath. It's <laughs> it's I, I do think it's way more common. Like for me, I I think like it's one of you know, it's it's an easy way to see how somebody's healthy in in a bunch of different ways, right? If their breath is bad, then what's going down on down there, right? I mean, like the people think that if you just brush your teeth, you get around that, but no, it, no, no, no. The, 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 it's coming. It's deeper than that. You see it like, you have to see it like this. We, everybody's talking about gut health, but gut health starts in the mouth because the mouth is the entrance to your gut. So if you have any interference here or dysbiosis in your mouth, it directly transfers to the gut. And if you smell upwards, it's, it's way deeper than this. It's not just gut health. It's a whole microbiome. That, therefore, I think for a healthy p- person like us, we probably don't have a bad smell at all. And probably the hunters and gatherers also don't have one. They have probably a bit more plaque, but you can see it in studies. They have no inflammation. Inflammation is actually what smells. Interesting. Inflammation, inflammation and the wrong bacteria smell. And the combination of it, including toxins that I see at it, you cannot imagine what I smell. Like it's really, I think my body is, has adopted to not smelling anymore. Because it's so bad. <laughs> I have my my sense of smell is too strong. It's like in this yeah. day and age, it's like, oh man, I can't I can't do this. And I think really, I so I remember I'm a surgeon, you know. I, I I deal with blood on a daily basis. I remember when I was a kid, I couldn't smell blood because of the metal. I don't like that metal taste. I don't mm. smell it anymore. And wow. I'm still very sensitive to that all the odor of like somebody who has a very bad dysbiosis because of the oral interference. I can smell that in a millisecond. I smell mold in an, in an, in an, in a millisecond. If somebody has mold in their mouth, I smell it in a second. Like it's, I know exactly how that smells. So let, let's talk about, give me your top five hacks. If, if not five, then three for bad breath. Somebody's got bad breath and imagine you're, you know, you're living in the Netherlands. You don't care about being politically correct or, you know, you're very direct. <laughs> what do you, th- it was funny. I was in the Netherlands for the biohacker summit and it yeah. was just literally, literally, I was in the store, somebody comes in and the guy's like, whoa, you have terrible breath. <laughs> like right in front of him. the guys, you know, the guy is, is, is like the store owner or whatever. And he's like dissing his customers is like, Yo, oh my gosh, yo, you got to take care of it. <laughs> he was like making a whole fuss. The guy's like, wow, your breath is terrible. <laughs> he was talking about his breath. For, I was cracking up. And so, yeah, imagine you're in the Netherlands. Somebody comes in, you got, you know, bad breath. You can tell them five things you need to do, they need to do to get rid of their bad breath. How do you know where it's from? What are the tips? Like, yeah, number one is obviously change your lifestyle and nutrition. That's always number one. Go off the call for processed foods. Number one. Number two, to actually start coconut oil pulling and do the tatan scraper. It will work as long as it takes until you have that lifestyle covered because you know it takes a bit to implement all these things. Okay. Number three is most big one, but you can biohack your way around it straight away. That's why you need a dentist for At one point, ask yourself these three questions that I asked you. Metals in your mouth, root canals, cavitations. So wisdom teeth removed. Any of these will always cause dysbiosis, havoc, bad breath. So nutrition, the right oral health care, and the three health killers. How does somebody know where it's coming from? Like, is it, is it the type of smell? But like sometimes it's coming from the gut. You could see, you could smell like this person's got bad gut bacteria. Yeah, but the gut, again, the gut starts in the mouth. You always have to, if you want to treat the gut, you have to do both. Gut is the entrance, you know, the mouth is the entrance because there's, you know, but when you start the saliva and you start them chewing, this is when all these enzymes get activated and the whole digestive process starts there. And if you have a lot of different micro, microbes, or let's say bugs in your mouth, the wrong ones, you smell. And it also, you swallow it. Like, I think you swallow about a half a liter to a liter of saliva per day. It's thousands of bacteria. So that's why mm-hmm. it's, it's, you always need to do both. And this is why I always say, you optimize everything. You have your diet unchecked. You have the ideal oral healthcare strategy. 
you are going outside and you do grounding. You go and do hyperbaric. You do the IV. You think grounding is going to help someone's bad breath? <laughs> Wait, I'm not just talking about the bad. Oh, okay. I just think you do everything for health optimization, but you're still not superhuman and you still have bad breath. Then it is time to see a biological dentist because you maybe have had the wisdom teeth removed, have had metals or let's say a root canals in your mouth. Because if you have root canals in your mouth, you probably most likely smell because there's tons of different bacteria in there lurking and producing their metabolites. And those are sulfur compounds that really smell really bad. Do you think it's normal to have bad breath if you didn't eat for a while or in the morning? Or is that a factor of you're not optimal? No, I think it's normal. Do you think it's just normal? I think that in the morning you will you will have a little bit of a different breath. It just, you dry it out. It just tastes, it just smells different. It's just, I think that's normal. Even if you're 100% optimized, you probably won't smell like flowers in the morning. Um, interesting. I think my, my breath like, definitely, I, I'll just tell you a, an interesting anecdote of. I don't say that you smell like ass. That's what, not what right. I'm saying. Right. You, you might I, like, you're not saying if you talk and you could smell it from like three meters away. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe it's a little bit different than throughout the day. Okay. I'll give you, I'll give you just an anecdote. I think now that we're on the topic, I found that I used to have no, nothing. I, I'd say like just normal morning breath, just typical, you know, nothing too, nothing significant. Just, you know, it, it would go away right away if I just ate something small. But I find that my morning breath now actually is not bad. And I, the, my main tips is number one, sleep with a dehumidifier, right? Because you're, if you're, your mouth is getting dry, then yeah, that could cause the growth of bacteria. Number two, drink water when yes. you wake up, right? Right when you wake up. So flush it down. And number three, for me, just it, interesting enough, Niacin just was kind of like that missing ingredient that fixed, it, it made my gut work better in a certain way that the bacteria, if I'm fasting, like it used to be if I was fasting or whether it's because I went to sleep or because I just didn't eat for 10 hours or whatever, my breath would be a bit worse. Now it, that doesn't occur once I, after the niacin, just interesting anecdote. How much niacin? The flush one? I take about 600 milligrams of nice in a day right now. Whoa, but the flush one or? I or take the... 100 milligrams of the flush with a meal. And then I take a 500 milligram slow release one. Okay. And the flush one, had, uh, when do you do that? Like breakfast? Yeah, exactly. I take, I take both of them as, uh, with breakfast. Have you ever tried 500 milligram flush one? I have, but it's not pleasant. <laughs> That's what I mean. Have you, I have you tried it at different occasions. I tested around with, with flush niacin, 500 milligram at various points of time before training, directly after training in between meals or whatever. And it's so funny. And like the most unpleasant experience I had with the flush one was tra I took it after training. So it amplifies the inflammation. And then I'm like two, I'm like one and a half hours. I'm like, shit, I'm in surgery and I turn like a cancer, right? And I look like I had the most insane sunburn ever. And it, you know how it feels like the whole yeah. body. My patient's like, Dr. Nishitz, what is happening with your face? And I'm like, oh shit, I took it at the right, at the wrong times. Yeah, that's I think the max, like, um, you know, like the hundred milligrams. Yeah, 100 milligrams during a meal. If I take 100 milligrams, not with the meal, I'll flush. With a meal, I won't flush, really. It, it pretty much won't flush. Maybe, like, very, very slightly. And then the 500 milligram slow release that it's released over eight hours or something like that, that doesn't... It's nicotinic acid, but it doesn't yeah. cause the flush because it's slow release. Yeah, yeah. And I find that the more inflamed you are, the more you flush, obviously, at that time. It's therefore after, after a workout, it's insane. Funny enough, before a workout, a high dose, you get a better pump, obviously. Interesting. Do you still take it? Like, is that something, is that part of what you do? I don't, I don't, need, ni I don't need niacin on a daily basis, but as soon as I feel any immune system reaction, I take it. 100 milligrams. The flux. Immune reaction in what sense? Like, like let's say I, I, I feel that I caught something. Like, okay, so you're saying to prevent an infection. Yeah. 
if I ran an infection or if I feel that I ate something wrong, another infection like in the gut, immediately take the niacin. The, the, and you find that that helps. Only the first one. Works. Only the first one. Right, right. With the nicotinic acids, you've and, and you're taking 500 milligrams? No, no. I only take 100 now. 100. 500 was just tests for me to see what's crazy. How long have you been doing that for? The, the 500? The, the 100. Oh, this, this is my pantry for long. So I have that on, on hold always. And sometimes I go in for like, let's do it. No, but for how many it. years, for example, like you've been doing that for 10 years, five years, one year, six mm. months? I would say at least five. Five years you've been taking 100 milligrams nice and when you yes. feel like you're coming down with something. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah, even, probably even longer, but yeah, for sure. Nice. I think that's a really good protocol. I, I find that, I found that the, since I started taking niacin, I haven't gotten sick, which again, I, I might get sick at, you know, at some point, but basically, you know, it, it, like everybody around me is getting sick. So I, I know that I've dodged a couple bullets with, with, with the help of niacin. So I think that's really important for the immune system. Yes, so my first strategy for everybody that I teach out there, also dentists, on causes is always, if you feel that you're getting sick, so you feel kind of like your cytokines kicking in, 20,000, sometimes even 100,000 IUs of vitamin D3 with the right amount of K2 and magnesium straight away as a single shot, plus the niacin, plus 600 to 1200 milligram NAC, and maybe a bit of lysine and enough of, a lot of amino acids. and usually works like a charm. Interesting. How, how often do you get sick? Like really sick? No, like a cold sick. Mm, or cold or think... worse. Any, any kind of like infection. Actually, I think I get, I get the right amount because I'm not a fan of people that tell me I never get sick. So if I get sick, I get really sick. I get fever 40 degrees. One day it's, fin it's finished. Like a little kid. Mm -hmm. I worked on this hard so that my immune system is kicking in like my kids do. And I would say like this winter, everybody was sick. Like all the time. I only had one day of a cough. I hope no, it wasn't stuffed nose one day. Mm. Should be on a surgery day. But I had it one day. That's fine. And before, so I would say this, this year it was twice. What about before you were into biohacking and, and this kind of stuff? Like, how often did you get sick? Like, all, like, before I was bio, uh, this is like my whole life already, 20 years. Uh, before, all right. Before, I was always sick, but I would always take antibiotics. Ah, uh, that okay. was the problem. I basically downward spiraled me. Now I'm happy when I get sick. So, you can see this when you're a parent. And I have, you know, I have three boys and my wife is pregnant with the fourth one. So wow, congrats. I'm, thanks, man. I, I see a ton of patients. I see patients. So I'm in contact with a lot of people, especially kids bring in different things. So kids have, are sick all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's actually good. This is their immune system training. It's just, and it's not a bad thing. But parents, right. parents, please don't go to the doctor and give an antibiotic for every disease. Let them have their disease, their sicknesses. This is how the immune system trains. Only if something really bad happens, like you, you, you get a fever over 40, then you might need to interfere. But before this, fever is, is something very amazing of your body. Only one degree of higher temperature, 50% of the viral load is killed already. So fever is nothing to be afraid of. Actually, if somebody tells me, I never get fever, I never get sick, I'm like, oh shit, you're probably in chronic, it's called CDR, cell danger response. So your body is not even working at all. <laughs> okay yeah, no worries you open doors for all bacteria and virus now living with you your immune system shut down so you're a dentist and when i got my wisdom teeth taken out they gave me antibiotics i think it's just that's part of the protocol right mandatory yeah. it's man it's man do you give it to your patients if you have to take out you don't we do one single shot iv because it's mandatory and the single shot iv doesn't go through your gut system it was actually okay for three hours. And we chased the single shot antibiotics straight away with a high load of vitamin C, magnesium, minerals. It doesn't go laser. through your gut though. Okay. That's yeah. important to know. That's interesting. It, it, I, if I ever had to take antibiotics, I should not take the pills. I should get like a, you know, some kind of IV or whatever. Right? 
I would get get an IV. It depends on what you need, but you all you know how you know how first pass mechanisms work and how little of the antibiotic after the liver gets to where it should go. Mm-hmm. So why not just shoot it and bypass everything and shoot it into your vein? Obviously, nobody can do that. That's the problem. That's why it's so easy to pop a pill. No, what I'm saying but if you have you access know. to an IV that they can do that. And you probably don't if you need an antibiotic, maybe you do an IV. But there's so many things you can do. You can run high dose vitamin C, which is actually also working kind of like an antibiotic. You can do methylene blue. You can do so many things before you even need to consider it. But I also have to follow rules. That's the problem. So regulations in Germany, you're saying? Yes, but also obviously. So we are dealing. So over the years, my practice has evolved. Let's say ten years ago, most of my patients came all over the world from all over the world. Because of being super, super, super chronic sick. Okay. They have seen 29 pa- doc- doctors before and they were chronically Lyme patients and they had Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and like all the nasty things, cancer. And they needed a 10 out of 10. They need all the root canals removed, the cavitations, everything. And we need to give everything. But now over the years, it developed more into patients that are like you and me and health optimization. They look for the next edge. They also need a 10 out of 10. Hmm. But they have, it's different. And if you deal with something in your mouth, for example, you had a root canal, all the cavitation, like where you, where they took your wisdom teeth out, you now have cavitation. I, I would say, I would bet, I would bet 99% that you have it and you will be on my chair and I'll help you get that rid of it. Because these cavitations are a storage site or K4 anaerobic bacteria, even mold lives in there. So now how, do, how do I know if I have a problem though? Sometimes, you know, there's a saying, if it's, not broke don't treat it right so yeah, yeah, yeah it depends we can just check it you can see if there's you a can problem. check we can check up front if you really have a cavitation we do that so i have a now i have an assumption what does cavitation a, mean I, I cavitation basically means they took out your teeth i'm just assuming you were in the teenage years let's say 14 between 20 and you needed it to take it out so that your teeth don't get crowded you're probably not prepared with the right lifestyle and nutrition and hibernation mode, and they just did a massive surgery. So what happens afterwards is your body is just in shock and, ca- and big trauma is not able to properly heal bone. So it just grows tissue on top and the cortical part, but inside, mushy bone. And over mm-hmm. time, it gets anaerobic and these bacteria tend to live there. They, it's a storage site for toxins. They even find glyphosates in it, parasites, fungi, mold. So you have a cave of chronic inflammation combined with chronic infections in your jawbone, which is directly in your nervous system. And this part is central nervous system, small intestine, and heart meridian. So chronic, chronic fatigue, all, all issues you name, you can have, and you don't even know it. That's the issue about it. You optimize, you're probably fine to compensate it. Why not? But I have one, my brother. How do you know, a- how does somebody know that they have a problem there though? This is the problem. It's a chronic silent inflammation. You maybe had pain after the surgery, but at one point when your body has no solution for it, it gets kind of lazy and just down-regulates receptors. So it baby basically makes it quiet and you don't feel it anymore. Mm. There's a special condition of the cavitations called NICO, neuralgia inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. These people really have Massive trigeminal pain, migraines and stuff. Mm-hmm. They they could should consider this, but ninety percent of all patients have no issues at the spot. But maybe can lift down. Maybe have chronic gut issues. Maybe have SIBO. Maybe have chronic fatigue or thyroid issues or MS. There's so much studies about it because there's also a specific chemokine in these cavitations called CCL5. If you just Google Scholar CCL5. And type in plus multiple sclerosis, find 3,000 pages. And the problem is cavitations or FDOJ, fatty degenerative osteonecrotic jawbone is what it really is, is not taught in dental school. It's okay. just, for them it's woo-woo. So right, you right. even talk to the dentist, they don't even know about it. So why would they tell you? They can't. Interesting. So what about, we were talking about antibiotics and have you ever given your kids antibiotics? Let me think about it. I would say no, but I'm not sure about Max. Mm. 
Carl and Louis definitely not, but I'm not 100%. I personally would never give antibiotics. It's not like life threatening. When's the last time you took it, antibiotics? Only for my cavitation surgery in Dravenus, but an oral antibiotic, the last time I remember was as a, as a dental, as an, in dental school. When I, in dental school, when I was still unhealthy, I would take an antibiotic for everything and even smash it down with alcohol. <laughs> thought it's just a regular pill that you just always take when you feel like it. Oh, wow. I took so many, and so like my microbiome really, it, it takes a lot to recover it, but it's, it's getting better and better and better. So the, the last two topics that I want to talk about, just briefly, we're, we're coming to the end. Teeth cleaning and fluoride. You mentioned no to fluoride. Is there anybody that should take fluoride or is that a hard no in your opinion? Again, same answer as before. For all my patients, no. We optimize your health so that you get the right nutrients to teeth harder as so If you are having a standard Western diet and you have very soft teeth, and a lot of inflammation, you might need to go that and unnatural, but I doubt it. Okay. Better go with hydroxyl appetite for that. Okay. And what about teeth cleaning? Is that something that you recommend? That's something that obviously every dentist recommends. Is that you mean professional you... hygienist? Yeah, like a teeth cleaning. Every They recommend every four months or six months or whatever yeah. it is. You recommend this is that? This is something I would do as a... See it as kind of like a cosmetic treatment that helps your microbiome and everything to just get rid of the biofilm. It's just more advanced. You obviously don't need it if everything is perfect, but mostly it's not everything is perfect because you also like to indulge in things from time to time. Mm -hmm. Indulge in like what, for example, like? Yeah, maybe you still eat something that you're not supposed to eat. You have your pizza and your cake at times too and... Maybe you like myself right. and you don't really brush your teeth and do any things. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> How often do you brush your teeth? One time a day. Once a day. And is that in morning or night? My strategy is super simple. Always in the morning. And it's a combination. So I cook my, my breakfast and do the coconut oil pulling at the same time because it's just time demanding. It takes me five to 10 minutes to do the coconut oil pull, at least five. Then I eat. Then I switch everything off and then let's say 30 minutes after I would, before I leave the house, house basically, I brush my teeth and do the, to the copper tongue scrape and that's it. Why not at night? I always feel like at night, you, yeah. you, the bat, you, you've already eaten everything. After you've eaten everything, then you brush, floss, does, I mean, that's what I do. I br brush and floss and... It actually, it actually doesn't really matter. You can also do it at night. It's for me, for me, it's all about consistency and about making it into a habit. That's just my habit. And if I forget to brush in the morning, then I do it at night. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Because I don't have, my teeth feel, they are clean. There mm. is nothing. So that's why I forget to brush. Right. Interesting. Okay. Very, very interesting stuff. A lot of stuff that kind of, uh, you know, took me by surprise, but. I like that you're a, you're a maverick, right? You're an independent thinker and. They've got a lot of interesting information, I got to tell you. Stuff that, that you. no dentist is ever going to tell you. <laughs> oh, not no, but almost. Like the vast majority. I, I You know, obviously, like every dentist has told me like flush, uh, flossing is like a must. And I, I think you are more nuanced about that. I am. And our, our mutual friend, Tim, he once had in his comment, in, in his, he had a post about dental health and stuff. And then there was somebody talking about oral health and quoting, Tim, you are getting information from the biggest conspiracy theorists in the whole dental world. That's me. So that's kidding. There was also the, the topic. I'm like, oh, you're the liver king of dentistry and stuff. So obviously, <laughs> I mean, I'm not the, yeah. the liver king of dentistry. <laughs> Yeah, I showed you there the comment. I quite quite knew actually. I didn't. Yeah, obviously because besides his the nowadays problem, I think it's a compliment probably. Right. No, I, that's hilarious. You're the liver king. Good. <laughs> I said it to you. It's so funny. You're the liver king of dentistry. That's hilarious. I thought thought it's hilarious. It's like, funny I when just, we. I, <laughs> I remember we had a conversation when we met 
that we were talking about conspiracy theories <laughs> and I was like, we, we, yeah. we got into the topic. How do you define a conspiracy theory? And then we ended out with anything I don't believe is a conspiracy theory. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was the, true. If, if I believe it's true, it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> exactly. That was your go-to. Yeah. Oh, like, that's yeah, hilarious. I think same. And yeah, we are forward thinkers and pioneers in the stuff we do. And obviously, you know, my mission is to help the many out there seeing that optimal health starts in the mouth and that finally all health coaches and all of us at least know that this is something that is the most forgotten part to talk about. And it's not just gingivitis, cavities, and periodontitis. It's the missing link is the dental, the dental repair, root canals, metals, remove wisdom teeth, which can really block your whole nervous system. And I think people out there are suffering mental health issues, all these things. That's why I'm that, on that journey. And I'm blessed to have learned that on my own health, with my own health issues. And I'm very happy that I can align with guys like you, like legends that talk about it and have amazing ideas themselves. And yeah, it's going to be a great journey. All the wolves out there. We are the health Avengers. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like that. The health Avengers. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, I guess, am I, am I the liver king of genetics? <laughs> You're the liver king of genetics. And I'm, wait, one second. I'm the... What is, what is know, that? Thor's hammer? Yeah, funny enough, it's Thor's hammer because we weren't sure which Hell Avenger. And my brother said, okay, you Captain America, but you, <laughs> you also have Thor's hammer. Captain uh, Captain Germany. Captain because in the back you see the Thor. And there's nice. the Hulk. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, you know. The Health Avengers, what we do, and this will mark my words, we will make health fashionable because we practice, teach, and preach it. And help the many out there with it. You're, you're the dentist health avenger. I'm the genetics health avenger. Let's do exactly. it. Exactly. And we all need to combine our forces to help the many out there. Because exactly. For changing the system. Everybody's got their, you know, everybody's got their own unique perspective. And, and it's so important, right? It's The dental health is, is really massively important. There's no question about that. It's And this is a missing link in all the teaching. You see it. Even in functional medicine, they just say, okay, there might be heavy metals. But the, even the, the World Health Organization, the WHO, last year said it, 70% of all chronic disease, which is our epidemic, start in the mouth. And they mm -hmm. only look for dental disease. That is tooth decay, gingivitis, periodontitis. They don't look for titanium implants, root canals, cavitations, metals. So this is underneath it. This is the root cause. Wow. This is mouth body connection. And you will hear about this in the future. It's going to be big and because it is, yeah, it is a system to be changed. Awesome. I, I encourage, yeah, I encourage everybody to go ahead and follow Dr. Dom. Where can people find you? Is there anything you'd like to, any last words, anything you would want to promote? Thanks. The most easy is actually to follow me on Instagram. The handle is Dr. Dom one. I think you probably have it in the show notes. Then there will be a link called Tap Bio, and you find my clinic, the DNA health and aesthetics, all the things, my new online course is ready. It's all going to be there. My book maybe is linked there, all the podcast interviews, the best one here with Joe. And it's all out there for you. It's my personal health magazine to help you out there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Dom. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Amazing with you. All right. Awesome. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping keep us ad-free.